My name is Tim Long, and I'm a licensed therapist practicing in Southern California in the US. I've worked as a therapist for 13 year years, and I work with a broad variety of emotional and relational problems that people bring in. But about a third of my practice is with men who experience unwanted same-sex attraction. And I was trained under and worked under Dr. Ni Joseph Nicolosi Sr. for 10 years. And as you have heard from this morning, it's not hyperbole to say that Dr. Nicolosi revolutionized how therapists can approach treatment for unwanted male same-sex attraction. Over the course of 30 years, he treated hundreds of SSA men and trained dozens of therapists in the treatment of unwanted same-sex attraction. Dr. Nicolosi passed away suddenly at the beginning of 2017, and since then, his son, Dr. Joseph Nicolosi Jr., has been working to standardize the treatment approach his father pioneered. So Dr. Nicolosi Sr. coined the term reparative therapy for his treatment. Unfortunately, this term has been widely misunderstood. Uh, so as Dr. Nicolosi Jr. has worked to standardize his treatment to become an approach people can be formally trained and certified in, he has renamed it reintegrative therapy, a term which more closely and clearly captures the heart of what this approach seeks to do. My goal today is to give you a taste for this powerful treatment approach by presenting you with one of the prongs of the approach, the dynamic assertion protocol. As I'll speak about in a moment, it's one of actually four prongs. So I actually have two goals today. For those of you who are new to reintegrative therapy, I hope to impress you both with how easy to understand and how powerful reintegrative therapy can be. And from being impressed by this, I hope you'll pursue further training and certification in reintegrative therapy. Uh, for those here with some training, I hope to refresh your knowledge and answer some of your questions. And in fact, I was here uh, in Slovakia earlier this year and I performed a training. Uh, those of you who were part of that training, I don't have the papers here with me right now, um, but this evening at 1900 hours, about a half hour before the evening session starts, I will be here. And if, so very important, if you were part of that training, one, two requirements here, and you wish to receive credit towards your consultation hours in reintegrative therapy, you can, you can do that by approaching me at 1900 hours up here, all right? If you have any questions about that, you can, you can ask me that uh, at, at the very end when we're all done. Uh, another thing with that, please hold all of your questions to the end. I know at times I can get excited and I speak quickly. Um, I'll try my best to exercise self-control and go at a reasonable pace, especially for my dear translator friends back there. Um, but I, I do recognize that even so, Please hold questions, write them down, and ask them for me at the end. I promise to, to leave some time for that. It's important to understand that this therapy has been developed against a backdrop of intense cultural tension with regard to sexuality in general and homosexuality in particular. Uh, as we've been hearing about, there's been this term bandied about uh, conversion therapy that is very ill-defined. And so as we have been re developing reintegrative protocol, Dr. Nicolosi Jr. and I, we've been very conscientious of this fact. And, and the way we are developing reintegrative therapy is in direct answer to this. Um, number one, as, as we heard uh, Laura Haynes uh, Mention, Dr. Haynes mentioning earlier, oftentimes conversion therapy, so-called conversion therapy, is associated with harmful and antiquated practices versus we are trying to, we, we are bringing about, we are training in standardized, cutting-edge, evidence-based practices. Another uh, way that conversion therapy, another connotation of conversion therapy is that it stigmatizes homosexuality as something different from any other problem or, or condition. And 
so reintegrative therapy is not just applicable to homosexuality. It's applicable to all manifestations of trauma and addiction. So there is no stigmatizing focus on homosexuality. Another uh, connotation of conversion therapy is that it involves coercion of some kind. And we are very much opposed to that. In our therapy, the client is in the driver's seat. The client determines the goals of his therapy. And number four is that uh, conversion therapy uh, represses inborn immutable parts of the self. And we instead seek to resolve trauma and addiction. And as we resolve the trauma and addiction, the homosexuality resolves itself. That is what we find as a byproduct of that. Now what you see up, oh, yep, yeah, sorry. Next, next slide. Now what you see up here on the screen are the four prongs at present. It, it is, I, I believe all good therapy as it's being developed, we have to be open to development over the years. All really strong therapeutic modalities, whether that be psychoanalysis, um, EMDR, um, a, a type of therapy I practice, emotionally focused therapy for couples, has developed over time. Okay, so expect that these things will develop over time. In the 10 years that I worked with Dr. Nicolosi, the therapy developed over time. We learn new things, we try to stay on the cutting edge of, of therapy in general, and as that happens, we develop. But as it stands right now, there are four prongs to re, uh, reintegrative therapy. There's the reintegrative protocol, which Dr. Nicolosi has, Jr. has developed himself, and I spoke about this last year, also taught on this uh, when I was in Slovakia earlier this year. The dynamic assertion protocol, which I will be doing today. EMDR, now while uh, the Reintegrative Therapy Association and therapists associated with that do not do specific training in EMDR, we are all trained in EMDR, and some of us are certified in EMDR. Um, you, you heard my colleagues, also reintegrative therapists, have some things to say about EMDR this morning I might disagree with. Um, and that's okay, we can have collegial disagreement. We, you can talk to, that's not the focus of this presentation, we can talk about that uh, at, at questions at the very end. Um, not, not questions during the presentation, but individual questions after after everything is over. And then the feeling state addiction protocol, um, which was actually developed by Dr. Miller, Robert Miller, that you heard uh, David Pickup and Robert Vazo talk about. Um, actually, before he did image transformation therapy, he did the feeling state addiction protocol, which is actually an application of EMDR to addiction. Um, so we do not specifically train in EMDR. Um, but we do, uh, for someone to be certified as a reintegrative therapist, they would need to at least be trained in EMDR and also uh, seek some training in feeling state addiction. All right. But those are the, the four prongs as we have it. The common thread through all of these prongs is these are all experiential approaches. You experienced that this morning. Uh, with David Pickup and, and Robert Vazo as they were taking you through an experience. The idea is that um, is kind of playing off of the old psychoanalytic or psychodynamic term of corrective emotional experience. Now as the psychoanalysts use it, they were, pre they were referring primarily to the therapist's client. And as the client worked through transference and worked through the relationship, the idea was that the transference neurosis would help the client work through their problems. In, in recent years, um, the, the brief uh, psychodynamic therapies, ISTDP, Intensive Short-Term Dynamic Psychotherapy, ISTDP, Accelerated Experiential Dynamic Psychotherapy. Um, I would argue EMDR. Um, there's also Emotionally Focused Couples Therapy from other types of, th have definitely been influenced. There's always this uh, cross-pollinization between uh, therapies um, to involve, to expand the corrective emotional experience beyond just between the therapist and the client, but also the client and themselves 
It's very important. And, and intentionally having the client interact via the imagination with parts of themselves in very particular ways. And, that's part, and that is how the therapeutic process continues and how we reprocess memories, reprocess internalized traumas, and also, as we're gonna find out here in a moment, develop new infrastructure, new internal structuring for positive experiences. So the role of the dynamic assertion pro, uh, protocol is the ability to master intimidating relationships and build capacity for positive affect. Um, so a tragic outcome of trauma and addiction is lowered positive affect tolerance. Now, what do I mean by that? Positive affect tolerance is exactly what it sounds like, your ability to tolerate positive affect. When people experience great amounts of trauma or uh, a lot of addiction experiences, they begin to mistrust and distrust uh, positive feelings, positive experiences. Those appear dangerous to them. And so they begin to dissociate from positive experiences. Um, for instance, a lot of men with SSA were frequently shamed for their masculine strivings. Um, you heard um, this morning, I'm trying to remember, Robert Vazo gave the example of uh, having, oh, I, and when I grow up, I want to be a policeman. Do you remember that? When I grow up, I want to be a policeman. And an affirming response to that, as he said, a positive reflection of that is to say, well, yes, the world needs policemen, okay? A shaming response to that would be, well, who do you think you are thinking you can be a policeman, okay? Masculine striving, positive affect, dreaming about the future, shamed, okay? And what happens is that begins to chip away at positive affect tolerance, okay? Also, many men with SSA experienced profound betrayal with people whom they had had positive affective experiences. Um, for instance, oftentimes um, in their youth, SSA men have special relationships with their mothers. Um, off there, we frequently hear stories of experiences of being treated as very special, okay, which is very gratifying and pleasurable for the man when it happens. But, what, uh, but also what could come along with that is the mother could change very suddenly and all of a sudden she's being shaming and aggressive. And so then you begin to distrust the positive feelings that you have in that experience. It chips away at your positive affect tolerance. Along with that, many of our men experience addictive behaviors and addictive experiences um, where they are experiencing gratification, great amounts of gratification, in the ad addictive experience, but then afterwards, huge amounts of shame. If you've ever studied the cycle of addiction, that's just part of the cycle. You're, you're in that period where you've sworn off the addictive behavior and, and treatment, and then the awareness of the addiction starts to creep back in. You start to have, be sensitized to triggers for the addiction. You act out the addiction, you have the momentary pleasure, and then afterward, boom. You have the, the lowered. You have the lowered PowerPoint presentation. Um, you have the, the the lowered experience. Okay, and so that will chip away at positive affect tolerance. So dynamic assertion protocol can be used um, for the development of positive affect tolerance. And as you're able to do that, it begins to also set the set the framework. Uh, set. Um, it begins to set the framework, begins to give them infrastructure by which they can begin to navigate intimidating relationships. And one very common intimidating relationship for men with SSA is actually relationships with women, particularly women that they might be sexually attracted to. Now, before I move forward in this, I wanna take a step back and just say a word about the development of heterosexuality in SSA men, as you see portrayed on the board here. Now, I think in 
in Western culture, we, nor we think of normal heterosexuality going in the opposite direction. So this is intentionally, from left to right, developing first friendship, and then warmth, and then affection, and then romance, and then sexuality, okay? That's how, we nor uh, that's how SSA men experience the development of heterosexual feelings, generally speaking, okay? But the opposite is what we normally associate, and, and a great many men who experience SSA have shame around this. They, they don't experience heterosexuality in the way that their, their colleagues, their peers, who never experience, or who've never experienced homosexuality, who've never experienced SSA, they experience it very, they don't experience it in that way. So uh, those of us uh, who have always been heterosexual usually start with a sexual feeling and then pursue a woman romantically then develop affection, warmth, and eventual friendship. Now, something I want to tell you, uh, one of the best things for me that has come out of being a reintegrative therapist over the last 13 years is beginning to realize that the Western uh, norm for development of heterosexual feelings is corrupt <laughs> and distorted, okay? I have come to believe that this is actually healthier. Okay? In other words, an advantage that SSA men have over men in Western culture who have never uh, experienced SSA is that they will actually experience a healthier version of heterosexuality and have less struggles with their heterosexual attractions because of that. Now, Again, we, we want to contrast our effective approach with the ineffective approach that most people kind of intuitively imagine uh, is experienced by SSA men trying to develop uh, opposite sex attraction. And that is that they are supposed to somehow manufacture or spontaneously experience heterosexual, that somehow you can will your heterosexual attractions into existence. And that leads to a great deal of discouragement and even more shame that, that worsens the, the experience. A better approach is to look below the surface and to see homosexuality and aversion to heterosexuality as a byproduct of insecure attachment and healthy heterosexuality as arising as a byproduct of secure attachment. So I want to talk briefly about what each of these means. What do I mean by insecure attachment? And what do I mean by secure attachment? So insecure attachment uh, is hallmarked, is marked by four characteristics that you see here. And, and the, the common theme through all four of these characteristics have to do with relational needs and how relational needs are met, okay? An insecurely attached person, number one, has difficulty even identifying his needs, okay? Experiences of trauma and addiction have distorted even ideas about what he should need and what he does need, and so has, an, has, a, has problems even identifying what he needs then even if he's able to identify it, it's difficult for him to express his needs. And that largely comes from number three. These, these two things, uh, these kind of things actually all work fairly cyclically. Um, the third one is does not trust that his relationship can meet those needs. And if I, if I uh, Dr. Nicolosi developed this slide, if I had my druthers, I might go back and I'll, if, if I had what I preferred, I'd go back and talk to him about reversing those three. I'd put the first one first. Does not trust that his relationship can meet his needs. And out of that comes an, a difficulty identifying his needs. And then out of that comes an inability to express his needs. Okay? But they do work cyclically. And then kind of out of that also has either overly diffuse or overly rigid boundaries when needs are consistently not met. In other words, when he comes upon an important relationship to him where his needs are not being met, 
he either becomes overly dependent on that person or he sets too rigid of boundaries with that person and is not able to negotiate it, okay? Is not able to negotiate it toward secure attachment, either by discussing it through with the person that he's having the problems with or by accepting that he's not going to receive it from this person and moving on to a different relationship. Secure attachment, on the other hand, is, again, able to identify his needs, able to express those needs directly, and able to trust that relationships can accommodate those needs. Now, I will add the fourth point on there, is able to develop healthy boundaries and express his discomfort in a healthy manner when his relational needs are not being uh, are not being met. Okay, so th th that's the basic difference between insecure and secure attachment. It all has to do with need and about my trust that my needs are going to be met. And along with those differences in attachment comes difference in emotional experience. When you are insecurely attached, you primarily experience inhibitory emotions when you're in contact with someone whom you wish to have your needs met by. You experience primarily anxiety, fear, and shame. And since we are an experiential therapy, we ground those in the body, that cold, contracted, closing down feeling. Whereas secure attachment is more often associated with the more expressive affects. I can be open if we're having a problem and tell you about my anger, not lashing out at you reflect, reactively, but being able to reflect, identify what I'm needing, and being able to express it directly to you. Okay? Same thing with sadness. If I'm experiencing a loss, I can come to you for comfort, and that secures our bond. Um, if I'm experiencing joy, I'm going to invite you into my joy, and that's going to secure our bond. So the overall, um, the overall reintegrative therapy approach to earn security in all four prongs of the approach is to actually begin to resolve this fear and shame, to, to be able to release our clients from the rule of fear and shame. Not that they never experience it again, but that they don't have to be crushed by it. And as we begin to lift the fear and the shame away, then they're able to flourish. Now, before we get into the technique, I do want to say a few brief words about therapeutic stance. Um, one, one thing that I am very concerned about, I think it's beautiful that in this climate, what we are doing is trying to be better about defining our approaches, being clearer, clear about our approaches and our techniques. We need to do that, and we need to have them manualized and standardized. But in that context, okay, it's very important that we do not lose sight of therapeutic stance, okay? Effective therapeutic treatment has both parts. Excellent therapeutic stance and, ex and excellent therapeutic technique. Therapeutic stance and technique, and they stand together, okay? Um, now, if I'm going to prioritize one above the other, okay, I'm going to prioritize stance, okay? because it is in and of itself a healing property, and it's what should be experienced by every person in a loving relationship just generally. And so if your clients are not experiencing a healthy therapeutic stance with you, then they're not going to be able to be helped by your therapeutic techniques whatsoever, okay? So just a few words about that. Um, first, about the internal experience. Okay, what a therapist is internally experiencing when he's in a good stance, he's curious about his client's internal experience, asking questions, reflecting back, clarifying, making sure he understands what is actually going on subjectively for the client. He's curious. He's open to whatever the client brings. 
uh, a, a general problem with therapists is we, we categorize, and categorization is helpful, okay? But at times, our clients will bring things and they won't fit our categories. Okay, and we need to expand our categories a bit. We need to be open to whatever our client is bringing to us and willing to enter in and understand what the client is bringing to us. We need to be accepting of our clients where they are. This does not mean necessarily accepting their behaviors or their distorted thinking, but we need to be accepting of the person. And then love. We need to have genuine desire for the well-being of the client. So these are things that, as therapists, we need to continually be working on in ourselves to develop. And if you do not do that, you will not be a good therapist. And how the client experiences that through the therapist's behavior is through this. Now, that previous acronym, I'll go back briefly to it, is from a man named Daniel Siegel. Um, there's another sheet I forgot to bring today. It's a, uh, but I will have it this evening at 1900 hours. So anyone in this presentation can get this. I have a sheet that has both important references, um, good source materials, and also a chart of the technique that I'm taking you into here today, okay? But on those source materials is Daniel Siegel's The Mindful Brain. And then this one comes from Sue Johnson and her emotionally focused therapy. And so when a, when a therapist has good therapeutic stance, it will come out in these ways. One thing is a lot of repeated language. We find ourselves repeating ourselves a lot, which in a lot of situations is not appropriate. You know, and if you're public speaking or if you're teaching, uh, generally speaking, a lot of repetition is not helpful. But when you're in a therapy office and you're trying to offer uh, uh, reassurance and comfort and safety for a client, you have to do a lot of repetition. Um, you'll, you'll embrace imagery, what, especially the images that the client brings up. You'll try to tune into those and, and, and try to understand those and reflect those back to the client. You'll use a softer tone. You'll go at a slow pace. And the one that I usually have a problem with, you use simple language, okay? Particularly, and that last one is very important, the client's words. If you can use the client's words to express back to the client what they're experiencing, that's very, very helpful. Okay, so therapeutic stance, prerequisite. You need it before anything else. All right. But let's, let's get into the dynamic assertion protocol itself. Uh, it comes in six steps, and so I'll go through each of the, the, three step, uh, the six steps, three on each slide here. Um, number one is to elicit an image of an ideal other in an ideal scene. Now, in the particular application that we're talking about, developing heterosexuality, it's you, you help the man develop an image of an ideal mate. Like what are the uh, characteristics of a woman that he could be interested in, okay? One thing about language and talking to SSA men about the development of heterosexuality, I think it's very important to use words like we are exploring your potential for heterosexuality. We're not making any promises about you will have heterosexual feelings, but we are exploring the potential here um, so that the man is not intimidated. By the way, I, I use vague language here, like an ideal other rather than an ideal woman, um, because the dynamic assertion protocol is useful for all kinds of different relationships. It can also, for SSA men, it can be very useful for the development of male friendships with men he finds intimidating, which by the way is very helpful in the working through and the um, diminishment of same-sex attraction. So an ideal woman, um, she oftentimes she's kind, she's open, she's understanding, she's accepting. That's the thing you'll hear in the video today. He's looking for a woman who is accepting of him. Once you've done that, you invite the client, you know, first of all, you elicit the image, you have them actually picture it. Oftentimes, we, that's, a, that's a step we therapists forget, is to actually picture that image. Okay, 
And then as they are picturing that image of that ideal woman, we invite the client to access what he or she would like the other to be thinking and feeling about them in that imagined moment, okay? In that, and so um, I want her to, um, I want her to be happy to see me. I want her to be excited. Uh, you'll hear the, the man in the, in the video talk about, I want her to be into it. In other words, into connecting with me. How do you want her to be thinking and feeling? And of these six steps, if, if I had to prioritize which one was the most important to be clear and, and robust about, this is it, okay? Step number two. Um, Dr. Nicolosi says, that, and when we see the chart later on, it's the lower right-hand part of the chart, that that is oftentimes the most difficult and the most important part for, for the man to be able to access. Step three is once they imagine that the woman is feeling this way toward them, we have the client identify the good feelings that arise in their own body as a result to that. We invite the client to breathe into the good feeling and make room for that sensation in his body to really fully experience that feeling. And then once he's fully grounded in that feeling, you can hear how slowly this goes, right? It needs to be, go very, very slowly, methodically developing these things. We elicit an action. If that feeling were able to take over, how would it express itself through you? That's step number four. Enlisting an action, asking if that feeling were to take over, how would it express itself through you? And then step five is to ask the client to imagine how he or she would like the other to respond to that. You know, and I, I find it useful at that moment to oftentimes break it down into how would you like her to feel? And then out of that feeling, how would you imagine she would behave? Okay, picture that as vividly as you can. Imagine that. And then we simply return to step two and repeat the protocol from there until the overall scene is complete. Um, a, a question I can imagine at this point is, how do you know if a scene is complete? And it's basically at the point where the man says, look, I, uh, when, when you ask the man, is there anything else you would like to do? And they say, no, I'm good. I'm okay. And is there anything else that you would like from her? No, I'm good. All right. So every, everything's good here? Okay, the scene is over. So in other words, the client determines when the scene is over. Now, a very, another question I can imagine you asking is, well, what if the client is having problems accessing positive feelings, as clients often do because they have low positive affect tolerance? And the answer to that uh, comes in three parts here. It depends on whatever negative feelings are coming up, how intense the negative feelings are. If they're fairly mild, it's a simple redirection. It's, so what does mild mean? Let me talk about that for a moment. Mild means that the good feeling dominates. There might be a tinge of, I'm a little anxious, but overall it feels pretty good, okay? And we'll say, hey, notice that. Acknowledge the negative affect. Yeah, there's some anxiety there, but let's really stay with that positive feeling. Let's really make room for it. Let's really breathe into it. Let's really tune into that. You are training the client to intentionally favor his positive affect in the experience. What if things are a little bit more intense, okay? We're talking now about negative affect that is about on par with the positive affect, or maybe a little bit more than the, the positive feeling, okay? Then what you want to do is actually begin to train the client in expressing what he needs. And a way to do that is these three steps that you see right here, is okay, right now you're feeling a little bit scared, you're feeling a little anxious, you're feeling a little embarrassed, okay? What would you like to be feeling in this moment? Well, I'd, I'd like to feel calmer. I'd like to feel a little more confident, okay? Well, in this exact moment, in order to feel that way, what could this woman do that would help you feel a little bit calmer, that would help you feel a little bit more confident in this moment? 
well, if she just, you know, put her hand on my arm and offered me some reassurance, that would help me. Okay, great. I want you to picture asking her for this. Okay? Ask her for that. And can you imagine her giving you that? Okay, and then once they've elicited this, they've imagined this, they've experienced this, then you return to step three of the protocol. What if there are high levels of negative affect? By the way, that's a picture of my refrigerator at home before we repaired it. <laughs> my, my wife is a photographer. Um, the, uh, yeah. Artistic rust. <laughs> yeah, it's actually, but very appropriate. Um, if that's the case, then very important here, and this is why you don't want to use the dynamic assertion protocol alone, okay? You want to also have good trauma therapies directly focused on trauma in your back pocket, such as the reintegrative protocol or such as image transformation therapy that you learned about this morning to be able to go back. Okay, And so it's not a bad thing, especially early on in the treatment process, if in the midst of the dynamic assertion protocol, the client is not able to continue sustaining the positive affect. We experience that, and we join the client where they're at. We say, that's okay. Let's work on that. Let's work on the negative feelings. Let's work on resolving the negative feelings before you go back there. Um, this final slide before the demonstration is uh, an overall picture. I know you can only barely make out some of the wording on there, but it just gives an overall image of exactly what the dynamic assertion protocol looks like. I had these. I forgot to bring them from the cabin with me today, but I will have them again this evening at 1900 hours. Please come and see me here, and I will be happy to give that to you. All right? We're going to move into a video demonstration. Um, this video uh, is of a therapist applying the dynamic assertion protocol in exactly the kind of situation that we've been talking about for a man with unwanted same-sex attraction seeking to explore his heterosexual potential. And I will begin. Sexuality. Can I form a satisfying relationship with a woman? My name is Luke, and this is my story. How have you been? What's been okay. going on this week? Um, yeah, um, I, I just went to my first concert this past weekend. Great. Uh, yeah, I've like I've never been to like a concert or. A, festival or anything like that mm -hmm. uh, yeah I'll uh, yeah I'll like start off where we left off I guess yeah yeah so um, we were talking about the kind of girl you were interested in uh, you described her as uh, someone who's feminine uh, someone who's adventurous and well-mannered someone not afraid to laugh uh, who confirms your masculinity yeah I just want you to slow down and picture being in the presence of this woman right here and now. And as you picture this, what thoughts or feelings would you like her to be having towards you in this moment? Uh, yeah, for her to like be okay with that, like for Yeah, for her to come a little bit closer. Mm, okay. Yeah, and how would she express that to you? Uh, for her to, like, give me, like, a respectful, kind of, like, inviting look. Mm-hmm. You know? Like, like a little smile. Mm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Good, good. Picture that, that little smile. Where do you feel that in the body right now? Yeah, it's a little bit like 
like bigger in my chest, mm. like just kind of like this warm, mm. relaxed feeling. Mm-hmm. Um, actually, I'm kind of like starting to feel it like um, in my hands. Actually. Yeah. Yeah, notice that, that feeling in your hands. Um, pay attention to that. Feel that. If that feeling in your hands were free to express itself towards her in this moment, what would you say or do? I would take her hand. Mm. Yeah. Picture that. Okay. Kind of like, like touching her, like feeling her skin and like, like kissing her cheek. Yeah. Okay. Picture that happening right now. You kissing her cheek. How would you like her to respond to that in this moment? For her to, to be okay with this, mm -hmm. you know, and like, to like be curious, like what this might mean on a bigger scale. Mm -hmm. And, you know, she has like no expectations about like yeah. where this will go, mm -hmm. you mm -hmm. know, like she doesn't, she doesn't expect me to like take care of her. Mm -hmm. Like I want to take care of her, you know, but she doesn't like expect me to take care of her. Yeah. Does that make any sense? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but for her just to be like, like, like genuinely like happy and like satisfied that this moment's even yeah. happening. Yeah. Then let's picture that right there. We're gonna slow down. She has no expectations, but there's a, that that happiness and that peace right there. Mm. I want you to keep fleshing this out. What happens next? I'm, I'm trying. I'm trying to imagine that. I just like, I haven't experienced it before. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. like. Yeah. What do you need right now in this moment? Drop into your body. What's the sensation? Without overcomplicating it. I guess. I just. I want her to just like accept like the type of man mm. that I am. Mm -hmm. Like I'm not, I'm not one of those masculine guys. Like, you know, like I'm like a little eccentric. Like mm -hmm. I, you mm -hmm. know, like I even, I like appear feminine sometimes, but mm -hmm. I have masculine traits. Yes. But just someone that, doesn't make me feel bad about those moments. Like mm -hmm. I, you know, so I'm not like, I don't feel afraid of not being what she wants. Yeah. Yeah, we're gonna continue to slow down and uh, we're going to track this moment by moment as we piece this together. You were, you were going along, you were connecting with her and then you, uh, you got frustrated and you said you needed reassurance, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you said that reassurance was that you're not totally stereotypically masculine, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. So we need to go from that, that fear, that reassurance. What do you need from her to go from that fear to that reassurance? I want you to picture this happening. What do you need from her? I just, like, I just want to, I want to talk about it. Mm-hmm. You know, mm -hmm. like, I want to be able to tell her these things. Like, I like art, mm -hmm. not football. Yeah. You know, and for, like, her to be okay with that. Like, I just need to be true to myself when I'm around her. Yeah. Yeah, picture that. Yeah. We just both, you know, like, we both need to be okay with who I am specifically. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I'll never be satisfied in a relationship without having a conversation like that. So picture having that, that exact conversation you need to have to go from that, that fear to that reassurance. Lay it all out there. Like, listen, this, this is who I am. You know, this is everything. Um, this is what I like. This is what I don't like. Picture having that exact conversation. How would you need her to respond to that? 
that she that she she gets it like mm. she you know she like sees me like she takes my hand and like like understands me mm. and like and that like, she she like means this like she she actually accepts me yeah and that you know like even if i am a little bit like mm-hmm. feminine it doesn't matter mm-hmm. to her mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. like she just accepts me as like as a real man good good so picture that picture her accepting you and seeing you as a real man yeah picture getting that exact response from her right now you shared everything now look how she she responds See that in her right now. Yeah. Yeah, I can like very quickly begin to enjoy that moment. Mm. Good, good. And like after that, she just, you know, she looks at me and says, okay, Mm. like, I accept you. Yeah. Picture all of that, but go to the body. Where do you feel this in the body right now? It's, it's just, it's, yeah, wow. It's like, Mm. it's weird. I like feel it like all throughout my torso. Just this like, just this like relief, Mm. you know, like this, this like scenario is like, it's like flipped. Like for me, finally be able to like, tell her yeah like how i actually feel mm. you know <sighs> but where is that in the body where do you feel that in the body um this like relaxed like warmth mm-hmm. like in my like in my chest like in my like torso mm. you know and like in a way i'm like thinking about like okay what do i do next but like not not in like a like a, a bad way, not in like a nervous way, but mm-hmm. just kind of like mm-hmm. like I want to move along with her like together. Yeah, absolutely. Stay with that relaxed warmth. We're gonna slow down. Take a deep breath right here. Yeah, if that relaxed warmth were free to express itself from you towards her. What would you say or do in this moment? We would like draw her in, mm. you know, like draw her in close, mm. like yeah, picture not, that. Not like in a super romantic way, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. but like, mm-hmm. like I feel, I'm kind of feeling this like, this like pulling, yeah, from my chest, mm. you know, like this. But that 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 warm feeling, like in my heart, you know, mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and like this is like the romantic aspect that I haven't really like gotten to until this until this day, until yeah. this like session, you know. Yeah. But just this like this immense like pull mm. from my chest and like mm-hmm. wanting of, mm-hmm. of her to be mm-hmm. close to her. Good. Good. Picture that, Luke. Picture that wanting from her. What do you want her to be feeling in this moment as you've pulled her in? That she's, like, grateful. Mm. You know, that she, she, like, wants to be this close. Yeah. How would you want her to express that? You know, that she just, like, she relaxes and, like, looks into my eyes and she's all like vulnerable. Mm. Picture her, picture that relaxed look, and that vulnerable look in her eyes. I want to go one small step at a time. I feel like that's where like my natural masculinity kicks mm. in, you know? Where like I don't want to like I don't want to take control. Yeah. But I want to I want to take the lead yeah. with her, you yeah. know, and like, 
like take the next step, you know, mm -hmm. like plan a date. Yeah. 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 Okay. Good. Good. So plan a date, plan an evening, you know, what would that look like? I, I would like for her to be, you know, excited that this is like, that this is even like, that this is happening, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And like, I would want to be able to like see that in her yeah. too, you know, like, like, like see it in her body, yeah. you know, and like see it in her, like see it in her eyes, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, like yeah. everything about her, like kind of like changes. Picture all this, picture getting that exact response right there. Yeah, that's... That's that's the ultimate affirmation, mm. you know, and like, and like she's excited about this too, mm. you know, that like, that we that we get to experience this mm -hmm. together, mm -hmm. and you know, but she doesn't have like any like expectations or anything about where this is going. Mm -hmm. like she's just like mm -hmm. she's just in that moment, yeah, with me, yeah. As you picture that, where is that in the body? Where do you feel that in the body right now? Yeah, it's like this, like, like kind of this, like this, like overall, like, like confidence, like mm -hmm. this feeling that, like, like just feeling it in my body, like feeling yeah. it in my posture. Yeah. You know, does that make any sense at mm -hmm. all? Like just kind mm -hmm. of like wanting to be yeah. a little yeah. bit more upright. Yeah. Feel your posture shift right now. Yeah. How would you like her to respond right now in this moment? You know, I would. I would love like for her to like to to see me mm. like this, you know, to like to like to see me as this confident person, you know, to see me as this leader. There's this joy, you know, there's like this, this immense joy. Yeah. Like, like feeling like that like like I can actually like feel this way and like mm -hmm. do this, you know, and it's like it's like a possibility, you know? yeah. it's like something that's feasible. Yeah, because like I've like I've never gone there mm -hmm. and like felt like the the attraction to a woman that I like felt today, yeah. like in yeah. like in this session today. Mm. And so just knowing that I can like walk out those doors and like mm -hmm. that's like not just a possibility but yeah. a reality for me. Yes. <sighs> that's huge. Like that Yeah. Yeah, that's huge. <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Absolutely, it was huge today. Good. We're going to do one last piece of this. Uh, we started off, uh, you, you needed reassurance from this girl. Uh, she reassured you that, that your masculinity is enough, that, that you're enough. And right now I want us to, to look into her eyes. We're going to do this last part together. So we're going to slow down, take a deep breath, and look into her eyes. And as you picture that, Luke, what does she know about you right now in this moment? You know, that, mm -hmm. that I'm enough. Yeah. That I'm... Like, I'm a man. Yes. Like, I'm a real man. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Uh, absolutely. And Luke, what do you know about yourself right now in this moment? That I'm secure in myself. Mm. Like, that I'm, I'm able. Yeah. Yes. Yes, you are. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Great work today, Luke. Thanks. Yeah. Feels good. Yeah. But let yourself feel that for a moment. Take that in. Yeah. Breathe it in. <laughs> okay. So same time next week? Yeah. That sounds great. Yeah. Great. Great. Look forward to it. Okay. okay. Me too. Yeah. Right. Take care. Me too. Today was good. And feeling excited and hopeful, I needed to explore this for myself. And I like what I'm discovering. Um, 
uh, I wanted to draw your attention to a website uh, that just went up in the last few months. The reason I'm drawing your attention to this website is not the website's main purpose. Um, so this is part of our battle against conversion therapy bans. The EMDR International Association uh, caught wind that we are using EMDR in reintegrative therapy. And so they made a statement against uh, sexual orientation change efforts back, I don't know, this was five or six months ago. And so uh, at the EMDR conference that was in Orange County this past week, Dr. Nicolosi and a few other people actually led a protest and pointed people to this website. And the beautiful thing on the website is they lay out, um, there, there's a lot about EMDR, and Francine Shapiro, the founder and discoverer of EMDR, and about her vision for EMDR was our vision for our clients, self-determination, that the clients determine the goals. Anyway, so basically pointing out that, those, that, that the EMDR, EMDR International Association their uh, statement was in direct opposition to Francine Shapiro's wishes. But also up on that website, and much more useful for you, are three videos that were just like the one that you just saw. Three videos uh, uh, kind of demonstrating reintegrative therapy. Dr. Nicolosi produced these videos. That, by the way, I should have said this ahead of time, that was not an actual client. However, the session was, an actual, was a script of an actual session. So it was a transcription of an actual session. But it was acted out by an actor. We, we wanted to get some professional production reenactments of these sessions up there. And I'm, I'm one of the therapists in one of them, so you can see me doing it. I do the reintegrative protocol with opposite sex attraction, with, uh, with a man experiencing an opposite sex attraction thing, and you can see me kind of help him work through and deal with the trauma underlying his opposite sex attraction uh, lust and compulsion. Um, so that's, that's up on that website. So I just wanted you guys to know about that. Um, all right, I think it's time for questions. We need to use a microphone for the translators, and I'm actually going to put on a translation thing myself. <laughs> Um, so that they can, um, they can translate for me. If you have a question in Slovak or in Hungarian, we should be able to switch over to channel one to translate to me, if that makes sense. I, I spoke to the Slovaks. I don't think I spoke to Hungarian. Forgive me. Um, but yeah, you should be able to, you, you should be able to hear the um, question in English if you, well, I guess if you're, I'll, I'll repeat the questions. Toto bude veľmi konkrétna otázka z mojej praxe. Um, pracujem s traumatizovanými deťmi, adolescentmi a um, momentálne mám dvoch, ktorí majú nedobrý vzťah s matkami, sú veľmi prísne. Či tento protokol môžem použiť napriek tomu, že viem, že tá matka bude stále pokračovať v tej svojej prísnosti, ktorá nepomáha a robí veci horšie. Ďakujem. So thank you. I'll repeat the question for, uh, for those of us who are English speaking. So the question was, um, she works with adolescents and kids and primarily traumatized that do not have great relationships with their parents, and in particular, mothers who are not the most supportive or helpful. And she's asking, can she use the dynamic assertion protocol with between the mother and the child, even though the mother is strict? And the answer to that is probably no, not, not as it is here. Now, there might be modifications that I might make to that, and this might come a little bit further on in the treatment, you could do a version of this where it's confronting the realistic uh, reactions of the mom, okay? That would come later on in treatment. How I might use it earlier in the treatment, it, as is, as, as you see it up here and as you've been, been hearing about it, is thinking about an ideal female figure that they could connect to. 
you know, uh, a mother type or something like that. And so for them to be able to imagine that and to be able to imagine this could be something that they experience at some point or that they could, you know, have access to, okay, elsewhere. Honestly, the other, the other thing that I would do probably in that situation, since you are a female therapist, that helps actually in that situation, okay, is, is having them explore the feelings that come up in them with you. Remember, we're, we're, this all comes from corrective emotional experience, which in the psychodynamic realm is between the therapist and the client. So that would actually probably be the best way to kind of apply the principles here with that particular client. When you show this, uh, you have shown this um, bridge reaching to the woman, Mm -hmm. And uh, I think it's a very powerful image. Yes. And the whole uh, session was about this image in a way. Mm -hmm. Because yes. he was taking this girl, I mean, on his side in a way. Yes. And w what I see is that this is a very powerful, not only for uh, SSA experiencing uh, men, uh, I also mainly work with adolescents. Mm -hmm. So what I think is that it's, in general, it's like a, a general truth about many adolescents that are rather shy than, uh, let's say, the opposite. Yes. So, uh, would you say that uh, what you're doing here in this therapy is like coming back to some kind of natural process and some men are able to overcome this process uh, themselves? Mm -hmm. You're just supporting them, uh, those who cannot. Yes. That's yeah. correct. And you guys are both bringing up uh, applications that I, I'm not even thinking of uh, simply because I don't work with children and adolescents primarily. Um, but that, yeah, that is kind of brilliant is like when you're in a situation with adolescent kids who are beginning to experience sexual and romantic attraction to the opposite gender, um, yeah, this would be a powerful way of talking about how do you develop a secure emotional bond with the other person. That's, that's a great application. Somebody in the back. Dr. Nicolosi, in his ex explanations of the way that um, um, the SSA attraction, the way that they, um, how do you explain it? How, um, um, by the way, are the, sorry, are the translators translating the questions? Okay, great, sorry. Well, he talks about how uh, the, the SSA attraction first has, looks at the same-sex person in a mysterious way and then never finds satisfaction in those, in those relationships because that mystery fades away. And so he goes from one relationship to another to another. Yes. Okay. With that premise, I was thinking about this video. Before mm -hmm. you get to this point where mm -hmm. you're trying to see the person attraction to the woman mm -hmm. don't you first have to deal with seeing like having good relationships with men in terms of good healthy friendships that indicate that the person's not such a mystery that he's mm -hmm. actually much more like you i think i don't know if you're trying to see what i'm trying to say it's like i do i, I think do. there has to be a bridge yeah. that's crossed before you can get to that point Absolutely. in therapy and so yeah this is kind of going so this is how therapy develops right over time this is something we used to say as reintegrative therapists and in the old days reparative therapists. Um, Dr. Nicolosi would stress the importance and the priority of male friendship before the development of heterosexual connection. And while I still believe that that needs to be the priority, that male friendships need to be the priority and secure male friendships need to be the priority, I, I, don't, I no longer believe that you need to um, put off beginning to explore heterosexual potential until later in the therapy. In other words, you can begin to talk about healthy emotional relationships with women earlier on in the, in the, in the, in the therapy process. And that's actually a good thing. Now, very important, as you could see in this, is we're not about trying to force anything. If a man is not ready to do this, we don't go here. This is at the client's instigation. It's the client saying, hey, when I'm a, I, which I used, I used to struggle with this kind of in the older Nicolosi model of kind of like, well, you just, you gotta wait. I know, I know you're worried. You don't, you don't have any heterosexual potential, but you need to wait a little bit. We can't go there yet. We need to really get you solid, secure relationships. 
And that can be discouraging to a client. Um, and, and so this has been helpful to have kind of a way when the client's bringing to us, hey, I, I don't even see this ever happening. Say, well, great, can we explore that? Can we just look at it together? And let's just kind of begin to set a vision for this. And I'm not guaranteeing you're gonna have romantic or sexual feelings, maybe even here and now, kind of early in treatment, and especially we're working on your bonds with other men, but we're just setting the foundation for, hey, this is something that could happen in the future. My question is uh, whether the, there is always the background of lack uh, of good relationship with father mm -hmm. and uh, lack of good man friends. Is, can it be observed in the therapy, therapic sessions that the, the, the clients, the patients, have experienced some, some uh, crashes in their relationship with with other men, with other, um, yeah, with the yeah. same, sa same and the opposite sex, parents, friends, uh, etc. Et yeah. Can it be observed? Yes. I mean, in short, yes. Now, we don't have um, empirical validation. This is all from clinical experience reported over and over again by reintegrative therapists is that our, our men experience profound lack. And frequently our men will come in um, even thinking that they don't experience profound lack. And then as we start to explore, and we, we tell them, what we tell them at that point, we don't force our viewpoint on them. We say, here is our viewpoint, you don't have to believe me. <laughs> Okay, here's our viewpoint, you don't have to believe me. Let's instead explore your experience and let's flesh that out and look at that. And from, our, from what we've experienced thus far, inevitably what comes up to the surface are particular lacks in, in their relationships both with men and with women. Thank you, Timothy, for all these things that you're talking about. I don't have any experience, everything is new for me, but I wanted to ask you a question, Uh, mal som kolegu, na ktorého som sa vedel spolahnuť a, a on už je vo vzťahu s uh, partnerom, a, ale keď sme pravidelne chodili na nejaké stretnutia, kde sme spoznali ženu, ktorá bola veľmi príjemná, ktorá bola a aj veriaca, bola, a bola skutočne ústretová, aj múdra, inteligentná, on zrazu povedal, že tu si vie predstaviť ako manželku. Je, je možnosť, aj, aby aj keď je už niekto v takom partnerskom vzťahu, cez takýto protokol ho nejak mu pomôcť? OK, so I want to make sure I'm understanding the question correctly first, so if you could translate it back, and you can nod if I'm getting you right, OK? Um, the question is, you have a colleague who experiences same-sex attraction, is now in a relationship with a man, Is that correct? Okay. He's in a relationship with a man. He was at an event with you, and the two of you together came across a woman that he said, hey, I could imagine being married to this woman. Okay? Got it. Okay. And so the question is, could this be used at that point? And I, I think with just the caveat of, hey, you, let's think about the implications of this. I think that's where I would want to start before, you know, just using uh, therapeutic prudence to talk about, okay, yeah, we're, we're willing, we could go there. Okay, let's think about the implications of that. Is that something that you want to explore? If that's something you would like to explore, let's do that, but let's also think about the consequences of that action. Does that make sense? But then within that context, full client, um, Informed consent, okay? Very important ethical principle. I'm watching my, my medical ethicist here. Very important medical principle is informed consent. Of uh, Let's think through the consequences of this particular treatment and, and the possible outcomes that could be here of if you actually start to experience some heterosexual type feelings, what would that mean for you in this context, okay? I think those questions might need to be explored first. Does that make sense? Yes. The, in the video, you see a very, uh, very sensitive dream of a man to, to meet a lady uh -huh. whom, with whom he has courage in the, to go forward. And uh, then, so I take it as possibly what's happening here is sort of desensitization in a way to the, so she, he, he's, maybe for the first time, he's not afraid to think in this way. 
Yes. Then my my question is, uh, this is so the relationship is very ideal, sure. and the lady is really like from paradise before Eve <laughs> fell. <laughs> I, I would disagree with that, yes. Um, so, yes, yeah, okay, yeah, so, so that's my question, that. how that, uh, I, I yeah, understand yeah. it can work to de yes. desensitize, to, to, kill, to kill the phobia, but uh, you, you yeah. understand my question. Yes, I do, I do understand okay. your question. The, the question is, are we doing um, the client a disservice by creating an idealized image, okay? Now, no doubt there will be some idealization, Okay, but I, generally speaking, if you slow the client down to what they're wanting, they don't actually, in their heart of hearts, want an ideal woman. They do, however, want a good enough woman, <laughs> okay? And what I mean by that, I'm using that in the terminology of, of the attachment theorists, the attachment scientists, going back to John Bowlby, where he would talk about good enough parenting. And that's why I use this terminology of secure attachment is the idea of a good enough uh, person that you are connecting with. And by the way, this is, this is encouragement I give to the therapists I'm training all the time, okay? What is optimal attunement? What does your client need from you in order to experience secure attachment? And it is not perfect 100% attunement. In fact, it's not 75% of the time you are perfectly attuned. It's not... 50% of the time. What the attachment scientists have taught us is that if you are, if you are well attuned to your client one third, one third of the time, 33% of the time, you are giving them optimal attachment. And you are, you're, you're actually providing for them secure attachment. And so that, that would be kind of my first comment with regard to that, is that I don't think we're creating an idealization here. I think we're creating, hey, a good enough, you know? And, and as you're working through that, if the client's negative affect comes up, it, it comes up to partially to, to meet that reality of, yeah, they're, they're not going to be perfect. And so I'm going to need to ask them for things along the way. Um, and that's part of the give and take, the push and pull of secure relationship, is the person may be good enough, but they're not gonna be perfect, and they're gonna miss it sometimes, and so can you speak up your need? So that's one part of it. The second part of it is this is clearly not the whole of a treatment plan, okay? And certainly, part of what you would need to address, and you could address this, again, through reintegrative protocol, you could address this through EMDR, um, uh, you, you need to address when they're met with women who are not good enough, okay? That might be important to them in their lives. They might be colleagues, they might be friends, they might be relatives that they have to deal with on a regular basis. And that would be, that would be the role of a, different, of, of a different approach. Okay, thank you very much uh, for having me and for your attention. Two quick announcements I made at the beginning, the middle, and now I'm making them at the end. Uh, number one is I do have handouts for this that I forgot to bring today. Normally I have my wife with me and she's been having some health problems, so she's, she's at home right now. And she remembers those details that I forget. Um, but I will have those handouts here at 1900 hours. In this room I will be here with those handouts. So that's, that piece is for everybody, okay? The second piece is only for those who have received the reintegrative therapy training that I, I ran back uh, earlier this year. I have certificates for you for your participation in this time, okay? That will help you toward your uh, reintegrative therapy uh, certification, all right? That's all, thank you very much.